Good morning again. We uh, continue in our series in the book of 1 Timothy this morning. Um, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16. If, those, if that reference seems familiar to you, it's because it's the third Sunday we're going to spend in this text. Um, I've entitled um, this sermon the same way I've entitled the first two. <laughs> A Godly Give and Take, Part 3. So a couple weeks ago, as many of you know, I was in uh, Indianapolis uh, training uh, young, well, young and old, really, uh, pastors and teachers uh, from various churches. And there was this one particular man um, that was sitting about three or four rows behind me. So every time I either came into the big room in which the teaching was going on or left it, I passed him. And, uh, and each time he greeted me with something like, good morning, sir. He kept calling me sir. In fact, I, I told Courtney that night, if this guy tries to help me out of a chair, I'm leaving. <laughs> My point is, is it doesn't take much to make you feel old. And so much of life, you know, once you reach a certain age, we can think of ourselves as washed up past our prime, has-beens. Other people can think of us that way as well. Older people can think the world has passed them by, that they can no longer contribute. And if we're not careful, that brand of worldly thinking can make its way into the church. It can infiltrate us. And cause us to start thinking that way. That older people don't really play a significant part on the mission that Jesus has set us on. It can even enter this, this lie, this, this wrong thinking. It can even enter into how we think about the care of widows. So think about that as we uh, turn to this text once again. So 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verses 3 through 16. It's a little bit of a lengthy text, um, but it's God's Word to us. Our Maker and Redeemer speaks to us in these verses, so pay careful attention. And I might add, children who are with me, little guys, God speaks to us from this Bible, so pay careful attention. Listen closely to these words. God says this to us. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I'd, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows.
the theme of this text is the same as it's been the other two times I've preached from it. With respect to widows, godly care is everyone's job. This continues to be the theme today. It doesn't shift. In other words, we look at God's word and we say, what does it tell us? I don't have the right to now take this text and lean into some other purposes that I have. This is the text. This is the theme. With respect to widows, godly care is everyone's job. We've already considered two aspects of this. First, we looked at the church's responsibility to care for Christian widows who had no family to care for them. And then we considered the role of Christian families in the care of their relatives who became widowed. So we've seen that with respect to widows, godly care can be the church's job and it can be their family's job. But what about the widow herself? Is she relegated to a life of being a recipient of other people's good works? When Paul wrote to Titus that Christ gave himself for us to redeem and purify a people for himself who are zealous for good works, when Paul wrote that to Titus, did he mean only younger people? That was the sort of people he was purifying for himself to do good works? Is that what he was limiting himself to? Did he mean people who could still work? That was the sort of people he was building for himself? People that could provide for themselves? Did he only mean healthy and wealthy people that would be his own possession? What about what the apostle wrote to Timothy in this letter? Again and again he writes about the necessity of godliness. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, I urge prayers be made for all people that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Was that to the exclusion of widows? What about chapter 3 in verses 14 through 16? At the end of chapter 3 there, he said why he wrote the letter in the first place, so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of of God. But only for young people? Is that what he meant? What about chapter 4 and verse 8? Godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Was he not speaking to everybody in the church? With all these references and calls for Timothy to lead the church in godliness and good works, did Paul really mean to exclude older women? Surely not. With respect to widows, godly care is everyone's job, including the widow herself. But how is a widow to show godly care when she herself may be in great need? That's what we're going to consider today. And as we do, we're going to take two worldly ideas that I've already sort of hinted at that can make their way into the church, two lies, and we're going to broom them out by this text. The first lie is this, that true widows have nothing to offer the church. That's a lie. Let's dispense with it right off, right off the bat. See how the text should sweep such thinking out of our minds. First, Paul instructs Timothy that true widows are to serve the church when called upon. True widows are to serve the church when called upon. This text shows us that godly care is not only received by the widow, but also given by her also. With respect to widows in the church, we should see this sort of godly give and take, which is why I've entitled the sermon that way. Look at verse 9 there, right at the beginning. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. I've been throwing around this term, true widows, right? The text uses it, right? Widows who are really widows, right? And we've talked about that. True widows are those who are faithful Christians in real need. That is, they're, they're unable to provide for themselves, and they have families who are either unwilling or unable to care for her. But also, now we're introduced with this age sort of barrier. 
of 60 years. In antiquity, 60 was considered old age. I turned 54 this summer. Thinking a lot about that. But we must step into the shoes of the original readers, friends. 60 was considered old age. Average life expectancy was actually less than 60 at, at that time. Remarriage after 60 was then unlikely, and so was a woman starting an occupation of some kind to care for herself. It simply was hardly done. So a true widow must not be able to provide for her daily needs and, and have really nowhere else to turn but the church. So when I say true widows have nothing to offer the church and that that's a lie, this is the people we're talking about, true widows, those that are truly in need. These women were themselves to serve the church. Hear me again. These women were themselves to serve the church. I mean, it, it doesn't come out right on the surface. We're going to have to do a little work to get there. But it is the, it's the broom, if you will, by which we're going to sweep away this lie that widows have nothing to offer the church. It starts by answering the question that verse 9 sort of sets up for us. Look at it again. I've read it, the first part there. Let a widow be what? Enrolled. Well, that sort of begs the question, doesn't it? Enrolled into what? And what is the widow to be joined into? What, 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 what is she about to be a member of? What is this list that's being referenced? I would submit to you that it isn't merely a list of women to receive help, though it is that. It is that, but it's more. To be added to this group necessitated that women that would receive care would make a solemn pledge. We see it in verse 12. But I'll read both verses 11 and 12 for the full idea. Now, I just want to warn you that most of the modern translations, I don't think, capture the right idea. The ESV from which we, we read, I don't think uh, does a clear job for us. And uh, I think the New Living Translation gets at the sense the best. So I'm going to read from the New Living Translation for you, verses 11 and 12. Listen carefully now. You'll hear the differences. Look at your, your ESV or King James or whatever's in your lap there. And uh, listen for these differences. The younger widows should not be on the list because their physical desires will overpower their devotion to Christ and they will want to remarry. Then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. The ESV makes it sound like they're abandoning the faith. And that's not what's going on here. So true widows, not young widows who were likely to remarry, would be added to the list of those to receive aid from the church's limited resources. But the church was to expect something in return from them, a pledge. If younger widows could break this pledge by remarrying, then the pledge had to concern remaining single. But to what end? Why would there be this pledge for an older widow to remain single? It must be because she would be devoted to serving God for her remaining years. It's the only thing that we can conclude here. Now, not all agree, but allow me to try to convince you of this from the text. The only other clue we have is found in the remainder of verse 9 and verse 10. And what do we have there? Look at it again. So, so let me just frame it up for you. 9 says, if they're over 60, they could, they, they could possibly be added to this list. And verse 12 says, to be on that list requires an oath of some kind. And right in the middle, look at what we have. Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works, 
if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Let me begin by saying that these details must mean more, must mean more than she was a Christian. It has to mean more than that because we have already, the, 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 Paul has already demonstrated back in verse 5 that she's a Christian, having set her hope on God when he was describing who a true widow is. You follow me? So why all this extra reputational stuff here? Why do we have it after the she can be on this list and she's going to have to make this promise of some kind? I believe it's telling us more than simply she's in the faith. The first thing mentioned here is that in addition to being old enough, a woman must have been faithful to her husband. Where have we seen that before? That, this idea of being a, I have to flip it around now, a one-man woman. Do you remember running into that in chapter 3? It's in the qualifications for church officers. In order to be an elder or a deacon, men specifically called upon to serve the church, that's the requirement. To be faithful to one's spouse. And so we have this sort of qualification for a, 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 a true widow to be on the list is that she has this sort of reputation. Marital fidelity is not only right and honors God, but it engenders trust in others who seek godly counsel and instruction. The second thing mentioned is the woman's exemplary life of service to God's people. Not only is she faithful, but she has demonstrated service and faithful service at that. Did you see how verse 10 begins and ends with the idea of good works? We have this sandwich. This, this whole list is about how her reputation and her devotion is of good works. In between, several of those consistent, ongoing works are listed. Having, having brought up children. Now, friends, this might not necessarily have been her own children. These might have been orphans. This, this, this might have been a woman who can't have children that was helping other people in the church raise their children. She's shown hospitality. She's cared for the afflicted, and, and on and on this list goes. This is exactly the kind of older woman you would want to do what Paul wrote about to Titus. This woman that's being described here, this is the woman that... that Paul would want Titus to look for and employ. Listen to Titus 2. Older women are to teach what is good. They are to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands so that the word of God may not be reviled. Friends, isn't this the kind of resume of an older woman that we want to employ in the church? Why else list all these qualifications? Why else list what kind of woman she must be? Thus, I believe one of the ways the church is to employ its limited resources, we've talked about this, we can't support all widows. But one of the ways the church is to employ its limited resources is to bless those who are particularly qualified and desirous of still serving the church in her remaining years. Rather than a younger widow who might become idle, like verse 13 speaks of, she is desirous of still serving in her later years. And I would just submit to you that if there's only so many resources, and we've already made the restriction that she should be a Christian, then the woman that's going to devote herself to loving and serving the church, she's at the front of the line to be on the list. I mean, this is, this is, this is not hard and fast rules here. This is wisdom for God's church. But it, but it does dispense with that lie, doesn't it? That the widow has nothing to offer the church? 
That's from Satan's lips, friends. This whole argument that I'm, that I'm putting before you that I hope is faithful to the text is designed so that we might broom away that lie and it might not enter into our thinking. It's right for widows to live godly lives right up until the end by serving the church. With respect to widows, godly care is everyone's job, including the widow herself. However, the care I mean here is the care she gives to others, not just the care that she receives. It's true that the older she gets, the less she will be able to do physically. This only makes sense. But that doesn't mean she's to be put on a shelf. Older women are uniquely qualified to serve the church as she is the kind of person, because of her age and faithfulness, she's the kind of person that has learned the lessons of prayer offered both night and day over the years of her life. She has seen God answer prayers. She she knows what confession of sin looks like. She, She knows that promise of God that he will always, because of Jesus, forgive her. She's experienced it over and over and over again. She has learned that God is faithful to his people even through what appears to be small acts of kindness and service that she has rendered over and over again. That that's the way that God normally shapes his church and brings mercy to people. She has seen children come to faith as she's navigated gospel conversations through various stages of life and and helped them navigate their various trials. She's experienced the encouragement others received from a meal or donated clothing or a place to stay when they were in need of rest. She's seen God's hand in caring for the afflicted, perhaps even her own husband in his final days. These are special ways, friends. Special ways that such a woman can serve the church out of that out of those qualifications, out of that experience. She is uniquely qualified to teach the young how to submit to God's will and delight in the everyday ways that they can serve God's people. She is a treasure trove of wisdom. Now, it's important to note that these qualifications are not simply earned by someone living long. Not everybody that's old meets these qualifications. If they are, it has been achieved by living close to the Savior for a long time, by knowing that this world and the sufferings it brings are not her home and experiencing the joy that comes from that knowledge. It comes from living with the faith Paul expressed in Philippians 1.20. I will not be at all ashamed, but that will, with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. That's the kind of woman we want to employ. That's the kind of woman that we want to rub shoulders with. That we want our young moms to be under her influence. And young dads, for that matter. It's a lie to say widows have nothing to offer the church. They can continue to offer godly care in ways that they can manage and in ways that flow from a lifetime of education in the school of God's grace. The weakest and oldest among us are to still lead in godliness, in the behavior that characterizes the household of God. So how how should we respond to this? Now that the lie has been swept out and we've, we've, we've upheld this truth that widows can indeed offer much in God's church, how should we respond to it? Well, first, for our senior saints, particularly our widows, friends, you have much to offer. I'll just park there for a minute. You have much to offer the church. You don't have to do what the young people do. That, that phase of your life is over in lots of ways, but that doesn't mean you have nothing to do. 
You don't have to do all that you used to do either. Look around at all these young people in the church, particularly young moms that the Lord has blessed us with, and pour into them. Invite them over and, and for a visit and suggest that you teach them what you've learned in, in how to pray and how to trust God when things are difficult and how to love other people when their lives are difficult and how to kill sin and how to live a godly life. Lots and lots my friends, that you can do in the church. For the rest of us, seek them out. Seek out these white and silver-haired ladies, and men for that matter, these treasures to us. They're gifts from God. They can serve on a team with young people doing heavy lifting, but they're to offer wisdom and help. Their guidance and perspective is a valuable service to us. Let us take advantage of it. When we plan new activities and new ministries, friends, you ought to have a, a, a mind towards reaching out to our senior saints and asking them what they think. They've been through all the things that you're planning. Well, quick, quickly now, let me address the other worldly thinking that can make its way into the church, the other lie we have to broom away. This text dispels the, with, the, with another notion. The lie that young widows' lives are over. This one might not be as apparent to you. It might not seem as big of a problem to you. Women being widowed early in their life isn't nearly as, as plentiful as those who lose their husbands later in life. But it's a tragedy. It's a tragic thing for a young woman to lose her husband. One of my best friends um, died at the age of 29, and he left behind his wife and two small children, and it was devastating. It happened a lot of years ago now. If I allow myself to, to, to park on it for a moment, I'll get very, very sad. It's a tragic thing. But the church is to train itself for godliness. It's to watch its life and doctrine closely. It's to hold itself out as a pillar of the truth. It's to hold out the gospel that transforms how we behave, even in the midst of tragedy. You see, the church is like no other organization, no other group, no other family. So when our young women if it happens, lose their husband. Their lives are not over. That's not what it looks like to be in God's church. And so we must gently and wisely care for them and help them respond in hope, in the midst of their loss. We need to help them respond not with idleness and selfishness, but with godliness and service. Now, not right away. There's wisdom in this, friends. We've got to help people. We don't want them curling up and thinking that their lives are over or, or squandering it with useless activity to try to keep their mind off of things. Treating them like they are elderly also isn't the right way to go. It's, 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 it's not right that we would treat them as if they were in their final stage of life. That, that is no service to them. It rather encourages them to squander their youth and what God may be calling them to in the next chapter of their lives. Again, there's discernment here with respect to timing and the, and the types of service and those sorts of things. Yes, the church and perhaps their believing family is to minister to them in their grief and help them to adjust to their life without a spouse. And I don't want to just go too fast on that sentence because that's a big sentence church and the family is to help them in that transition, that difficult transition. But they are to encourage them to find their way back into serving God and his people with the youth and energy and gifts that God has given them. While there's no rule that says older women must pledge to remain single or younger women must remarry, that 
That is the general pattern. And so younger women ought not to make rash vows to remain single. This is what's being referenced here in our text. Sometimes we say things in our grief that we feel afterwards sort of define us and, 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 and how we must remain. But foolish oaths to stay single in service to God in order to be on some list or something like that can lead to being judged foolish and even bring disrepute to the church. Now, we don't have a list like that. I get that. So we have to make application here where it hits us. And it's this. We've got to love younger widows and help them get back in the game. And that might include being remarried at some point. That is the general pattern for women who are younger. It's certainly not required. Paul writes much in 1 Corinthians about the call to single, singlehood and the call to, to marriage. I mean, I am not called to singleness. I hope nothing ever happens to Courtney but I would be undone by myself. Everybody that knows me knows I cannot be by myself. And that's how most people are. So most people should be remarried if they're of the age. That makes it likely. I know it's maybe weird to talk about a situation like this when there isn't that kind of situation that's right there in front of us, but who knows what's coming, friends? So let's prepare ourselves with the truth. The church does not love young widows by leaving them to fritter away their days in idleness and gossip. They are to be encouraged to pray and dream and train themselves and flourish in service to a new husband or to others in the church. It's a lie to think young widows' lives are over. They have lots more to give to their Savior. And even more through the, through the trials through which they'll come. We will all experience difficult trials. We're all going to lose people. We're going to have tragedies, friends. Many of us will lose a spouse or experience some other thing that we don't want to think about right now. But when that happens, we must see it as God preparing us for what's next. God prepares us through suffering, sometimes to comfort others who will suffer the same way. First Corinthians talks about, or Second Corinthians talks about that. Sometimes the death of a spouse is to set the stage for yet another fruitful life with, 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 with another spouse, to raise another family where faith in Christ will be the blessed result. We don't know what's next. So we have to look at these trials as God preparing us for greater service. The Savior who poured out his life for others calls us to do the same regardless of where we're at. Whether we are a young widow with, with likely many, many years left of service or whether we are an older widow and we think our time is short. Friends, the, the Savior poured out his life for others and we are called to do the same. And it's not just for widows, of course. With respect to widows, though, godly care is everyone's job including the widow herself. So much we could talk more about in this text. But friends, I hope that you will see that God gives us people to care for as a gift so that we might enter into the Savior's love. It's everybody's job. It's the job of the church. It's the job of the Christian family. And it's the job of people who are in need themselves. I want you to just take a quiet moment of reflection for two, for two purposes. Just let the Word of God rest on you for a moment and ask how God might be calling you to respond. And secondly, prepare your heart for the Lord's table to which we are about to turn. If you need to confess sin, do that now. If you've been putting that off, don't put it off no longer. If you are not yet a Christian... 
we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and I don't want you to participate in that. God warns people that participate in this ordinance that they do so to their own condemnation if they're not yet in faith. So think about these things for a few moments.